You are listening to Mind Pump, the world's number one ranked fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. Now, in today's episode, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by listeners and viewers just like you. But the way we open the episode is where we talk about current events, we talk about studies. That's the intro portion. Today's intro portion was 37 minutes long. After that, we got into the fitness question. So let me give you a breakdown of today's episode. We open up by talking about two new Guinness Book uh, records that were set recently. Oh, yeah. Weird ones, uh, but interesting. You got to check it out for yourself. Then I talk about how my daughter experienced a little bit of bullying online and trying to stay grounded. That's what I'm Mm. trying to do right now, stay grounded. It's tough. Then I talked about a podcast that I listened to recently uh, by Arthur Brooks. Great podcast. He talks about politics and happiness and why the more involved you are in politics, the the less happy you will be. Um, then we talked about a, <laughs> actually Justin talked about being the only sober person in the room when everybody else was doing salvia. Yeah, I don't recommend it. That sounds like a great time. And then I talked about a study done on a product by Caldera Lab that showed that people had dramatic improvements in their skin. Now, Caldera is a company that we work with that produces some pretty incredible skincare products. Uh, one of the products, the good, is 100% plant based, it's non GMO. And it's the first men's skincare product in the U.S. to be both made safe certified and ink eco cert certified. There's no gluten, no parabens, no aluminum, no animal ingredients, no toxic chemicals, no synthetic preservatives, no silicones, no formaldehyde, no phthalates. Uh, it's really, really good stuff. Um, and the research and clinical trials show dramatic improvements in skin. So here's some of the numbers. of people reported healthier skin, 91% less dryness, 87% showed improved fine lines and wrinkles, 89% showed improved radiance and luminosity, and 85% showed more even skin tone. So if you want to try the product out, use the Mind Pump discount for 20% off. Here's what you do. Go to calderalab.com. That's C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B.com forward slash Mind Pump. And then type in the code Mind Pump and get that 20% off. After that, we got into the fitness questions. The first one, this person wants to know why, uh, how you can move from tracking your food to eating more intuitively. The next question, this individual wants to know why the leg extension has been demonized. The third question, this person wants to know, look, I'm trying to get my squat to increase. Should I focus more on intensity or volume? And the last question, This person wants to know how to work with and maybe solve their type A personality traits. Also, one day left for a huge workout promotion. Okay, so all of our workout programs, all of our MAPS workout programs are 50% off. You have 24 hours left to take advantage of this promotion. All of our bundles are also 50% off. So bundles combine multiple programs. Already discount them so you can throw an additional 50% off. Okay, so huge sale. Wow. Here's what you do. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Find the program or bundle that works for your goals and your body, and then use the code October50. That's the word October, the numbers, five zero, no space, and you will get 50% off. Again, you have 24 hours to take advantage of this promotion. Doug, can you pull up one of the first links there that I sent you? I want oh, you yeah. guys to see what do you got. Okay. Well, well, what do you got for us? Well, you know how like uh, it, we're, you know people are just, we're just competitive, right? <laughs> A little I bit. can't I can't personally say I'm more competitive. I can't than say you. that I'm the best at anything in the world, mm. right? Can you guys say that at all? No. Right. Uh, no. No. Right. He had a, the guy over here to think uh, about it. For yeah. He's, He's like, like well, well, let me think I'm about. Kind it. of the best. I'm, at, uh, nah, I'm yeah. pretty good at a lot <laughs> of things. Probably somebody else. I'm pretty good at a lot of things. Let me think here real quick. <laughs> I'm also the best at being humble. <laughs> He's like, I'm pretty. Yeah. I'm pretty good at sex, but we don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't want to go there. I don't want to. I don't want to show the videos. Measure that. Yeah, no. I so want you guys to get uh, comfortable. So there's a couple new Guinness Book of World Records uh, that were sent uh, that uh, we're waiting for the. The, the screen to come up here. I think Doug's having more technical. That's always my favorite, by the way. When we have technical <laughs> te- 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 technicalities. <laughs> yeah. Doug, Doug gets Technologicals. Us. We Doug gotta come get, up with a word for that. Electronicals, yeah. technologicals. Yeah, Doug gets so stressed out, you know, and angry. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> 
You already had this all pre-planned to, yeah. to just shoot up there. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to send it ahead of time so we don't have right. technical yeah. difficulties. That, but, that was smart. But right now, yeah, so let, uh, let's start this over because you, no, you, no. you have to let me get everything kind of No, proud. this is no, better. It's better yeah, this like way. It this no, way. Doug, it's better this too. way where you're rattled. It's, I like it. It's, <laughs> no, it's, it's makes me The problem is I'm having problems with the, 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 the casting. So. That's okay, Doug. That's yeah. life. Yeah. No, just, <laughs> life is rough sometimes. That's all going to work its way out. We're going to keep going, right? Yeah. This, this ship goes on. I just yeah. don't we'll be want, fine. I just yeah. don't. I just don't want him to. Hey, you put all my made up words in the podcast. You, gotta, <laughs> <laughs> you don't take the time to edit that shit. So yeah. Yeah. I don't want. That. There it is. There's one. Oh, one. see. Okay. So right this, on point. So this guy, this guy right here, is a Guinness Book of World Record holder. Oh my god, I'm already excited. Look at this guy. He, uh, Mo- he the most modific body modifications. The most body modifications. He looks like a demon in the ever right. 516 body modifications. What? Yeah, so he's now, got- I include some of them. What are, what are they? I see- uh, Well, tattoos, piercings- some horns. Subdermal implants. The subdermal implants are really interesting. Yeah. Uh, the He has uh, the world record for the most piercings when they were officially counted at 453. 158 piercings around his lips alone. I bet his parents are so yeah, proud. Yeah, look at-, look at What's in his t- What's going on with his tongue? I don't know, oh. dude. Did he split it? What's wrong with his eyes? Are you, are you guys not seeing this? Yeah, I think so. What he did is he tattooed his eyes or whatever. They inject ink, so they're completely black. He's got oh the God. subdermal horns, uh, the ears. He yeah. looks like a conservative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he voting for? Right? <laughs> yeah. We have That's no my idea. guess. Isn't that crazy right there? Oh, man. Why? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's oh, that's little- scary. That's scary T- tongue stuff. Roll. So there's that, and then there's the other one. Doug. So what I, I I don't know. I'm more interested in the person that's attracted to that. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. If Do you get a partner after well, that? Or well, I don't know. know. Is he, he's got to be flying solo. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, he's the best in the world at that. That's I mean, true. Could be attractive to somebody. Oh, yeah. Now I mean, this one, this one on gives everybody. me the willies, bro. So this next this one, this one gives me the. This willies. is another Ugh. Guinness Book of World Record. This guy, oh. <laughs> was able to cover himself with 140 pounds of bees. Wow. For the Guinness Book of World. Now past it. How many bees is 140 pounds? A lot, a lot. That's a like <laughs> And they just dump it on him. They're not even like gentle about it. They're just Ooh. Well, I imagine Okay, so think about it this way first of all. Think of a standing with a 140 pound suit. Yeah. Like that would be hard to do anyway, but now it's bees crawling look, around look, and stuff. Look how miserable his face is right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. They're just stinging the shit out of him uh, right now. Look at that. Uh, now I know you, Adam. You have a thing with bees, right? I do. No, it's I'm like traumatized. Is that uh, all? That's all from that time that you. Yeah, that's it. It's all it took one bee to come down, or what I thought was what crawling. Happened? Remember when I when I told you that when I was in uh, high school, I did uh over the summer. Like, I was one of those kids, right? And I, I, don't, I think you guys. I think we've talked about this before. I any anything for some side money. Like I would I would take any job, any side thing. So someone Is that when off. you started hooking? Yeah. yeah. Stop, dude. Well, side yeah. businesses. Anything yeah. that, there's no out in the country where I live, there was no money in that, or maybe I'd consider <laughs> it, right? So <laughs> Hook it. Yeah. hooking. So one of my uh the girls that I went to school with, her mom, uh, they had like this little bee business and she's like, Would you know, would you like to make and it was good money. I I can't remember for me it was like at that time it was like twenty dollars an hour, which was like Oh, that's a lot. Dude. Yeah, that was like five X the minimum wage. So I was, yeah, like, I was like, Oh my god. God. That's a- so, but you go in the middle of the night, right when they're sleeping, and it was the we were moving, uh, you know, bee crates or whatever you call them, and that's when I had to get the whole suit on and everything. And I told you guys that it was like it was I could feel them crawling and running, you know, under the under the suit, and oh, I, I got yeah. so hot and sweaty that I felt the sweat running down my back, and then I felt it run down my crack, and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a, I went like sprinting away, ripped everything off. I had to call it, dude. I was like, I can't do this. I can't just be working while these things are crawling all over you, and then you're sweating inside the suit, and you can't tell if you sweat, if it's run- sweat or bee. Yeah, a sweat or bee running down your your body, and it's just oh, too man. freaky feeling for me. And then you also. It's inevitable. Tried to viol- they tried get to violate it. you on top of well, it. Well, it's impossible. Yeah. Like so, at least the suit that I had, and maybe today, like it God, does- if you had, do you have a picture of this? I oh, know, I no. wish. Oh no. man, this is so this is before people carried iPhones around and took pictures of everything yeah. they did, right? So this is what way before that. <laughs> 
In fact, I don't even think the I had. I think they had a beeper at this time, dude. I, didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, I had a beeper. Yeah, yeah. You, you could you could beep me out there. Yeah, so you, could, right. yeah you could call me. But yeah, yeah, why? You know, like only drug dealers are the ones that needed it. You were so important. It was you know, cool in yeah. seventh grade. Well, That's you the don't, reason why. don't you remember too? You you could do code with each other. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, your beeper would vibrate in class, and then you could pull it off, and you can oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Bo- boobless. That's right. He boobless. Said, have, remember boobless? Have a good day. Have a good day. Okay. It was eight. It was like a what was it? Two two three. I don't remember. Remember what the code was? You turn it upside down. It said oh boob- yeah, yeah. Boobless. You do the calculator too. Yeah, these are all things that we did as kids. Oh, yeah. By the way, Adam, mm. I am digging the cholo look for today. That's nice. I know, man. I don't know how much of it's a cholo look. It's kind of racist to say that. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's- just because just because I have quarter Mexican in me, it's a cholo look. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, flannel and, and Carhartt You're is the not flat cholo. Land cholo. I'm well, a yeah. mountain cholo. So I mean, <laughs> you had it buttoned up all the way when you walked in. Well, that's, I want to be able to separate what gang I'm with compared to Justin because Justin right. wears the flannel. Every once in a while, Justin's so. the mountain cholo. Yeah, the mountain cholo, the Jesse James gang. <laughs> yeah. you're the, don't I think th- you're. I think you're racist, guy. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up, dude. Shut up. Uh. You got the beanie. The only thing that throws it off is the is the torn jeans. If you had Dickies on, I'd be like. That's great. Yeah, that, oh, yeah. that would definitely. Cortez on. Then yeah, you'd be good. and the what are those belts that, with the you know the? Oh yeah, the ones that the, it's like you just pull it through. Yeah, is there what a is name for that? Yeah. I don't know what ah. the name Dude, is. Dude, you got to remember, I grew up in South San Jose. That was a legit style. I'm not trying to be racist or whatever. No. White white dudes dress like it. Black oh, yeah. dudes dress we like it. We adopted it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's not. A, it's not a. It's not a Mexican thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. you're trying to backpedal on the racism. No. <laughs> <so. laughs> it was very like inclusive. Yeah. It uh, works style. That, I'm gonna try that more. That works so good. Just to call. Someone a racist when they say shuts them up, hell yeah, fast. real fast. Like, yeah. oh, ooh, ooh, wait a minute, I got a uh, backstory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Let me provide. Isn't that funny? It's a natural reaction. No, but right? That's the thing. Sal felt the need to tell us, like, to justify yeah. that. Isn't that crazy? That's well, what, I mean, you know, that's, you just that's ne- the climate, though. The next yeah. one is pedophile. You say that. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's the yeah, next you one. Just that drop the bomb right there. We'll try, we'll try it in a meeting. You know, we'll be in a meeting, and Adam will be like, "I think we should do this." No, I think he'd be like, "I don't know, Sal. It's racist." Like, fuck. Oh man, how do I get We're going with what Adam said. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, dude, dude, uh, uh, man, I had a tough uh, situation this morning. What's that? So, you know, my kids are now at the age where you, they start to deal with other kids bullying and stuff like that, right? So, my mm-hmm. son's fifteen; he's nothing with him. But my daughter's eleven, and you're, I'm starting to see that stuff with other kids. Here's the challenge: wow. as an older brother, it was easy for me to handle. When I had my younger siblings, if someone bullied him, I would just go beat them up. Done. It yeah. was fixed right, right. away. Yeah. Can't do that with my kids because uh, that's frowned upon. You know what I mean? So this morning, so this morning, I hear that my daughter. So she plays Roblox, and I guess there were some kids, or I don't know who, anonymous people, texting some terrible shit to her through the through the system, telling her to kill herself and whatever. What? Yeah, dude, dude. and it made her cry. And I'm just like, it was dude. an anonymous person. Yeah, dude, it's just it's a, it's the reality of today. It made me so furious. Like, what do I do? You know? Yeah, and it's all online, so it's it's Whoa. inevitable. Like, like my my kids have experienced some of that too. Really, it's online? Yeah, it's just the it. And every now and then you'll get like just some shitheads coming through and just dropping in some troll comments, and then you know. So I I try to manage every now and then, but you can't. Like it, they just come in and out, and and they're just like so, shitty. So two things: one uh, is if if it was a text message, don't you have the number? No, no, no. It's not a text. It's like a DM. Uh, uh, ver- it's like a DM. They function. like comment within the game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. you can't track and see who it is. No, but... it's anonymous. Okay. And yeah. then what what is this? Con- I'm curious. What does this conversation look like for you guys for the kids? Like, what are you saying to your kids about? Well, it? what I'm going to tell her is I'm going to say first of all, uh, you don't know who they are. The random random people they just do this because they think it's like a crank call Mm -hmm. it's nothing uh personal and there's people in the world that are like this i mean part of me is like okay this is introducing her to the real world a little bit that Mm -hmm. people can be this way right so but the other part of me of course is like super protective dad which is like you made my daughter cry you know what i mean i'm gonna go slap some people yeah i know and i look at like options for limiting who comes in and out uh, like there's ways where they can just go on when their friends are, are on there. And so there's ways of like, like at least like pushing off a lot of like the random public that comes into these online games. Uh, so there's like some firewalls there, but yeah, they're going to see it. And it's just a matter of like, if they see it, they're supposed to tell me about it. And th- that's really like, I'll have a conversation about yeah, it. You know what it is? It's that I, <clears throat> First of all, as a kid, I hated bullies anyway. I didn't really get bullied maybe a couple times, but I hated seeing other kids do that to other kids that were either weaker or more timid. It really yeah. used to piss me off. Oh, yeah. 
But here's the big reason why I think it bothers me is, well, of course, it's my kids, right? So anything that they that when they feel bad, I feel bad. But it's also because I remember what that felt like as a kid. Mm-hmm. Like there's almost no, you know, can you, it, it's a it's a really bad feeling. It's not like hurting yourself where you fall down and hurt your knee. It's like the, you guys remember that, right? You feel the the shame and the pressure or whatever from your peers, and so she's perceiving it that way, and it makes me so mad. Yeah, it's a. <clears throat> I've, yeah. Obviously, I haven't dealt with it as a dad yet, so it's an interesting thought, like <clears throat> how I would deal with it, because I feel like you. <clears throat> There's you have there's a fine line, right? Like you don't want to be overprotective about it because the truth is it is, it is today's time. Totally. Right? I mean, so like, well, it's like that it was like that when we were kids too. It's yeah. just now it's through yeah, it's just exactly. different version of it. Yeah, instead of it being in person, it's I, I don't know. So which is worse, right? Is it worse to be a, at school and then having like a kid actually like literally physically bully you and say something, yeah, or is like it worse? psychological torment now? Right, or is it worse on like Instagram or like what what would be worse as a kid? I mean. Well, I've, I've heard stories too of people, uh, you know, <clears throat> taking taking an image in in direct messaging like other kids oh, yeah. with like terrible stuff that they're saying, and they, they create fights on behalf of a kid that doesn't even know they're doing this uh, to them. So they they basically set them up, or they'll take a photo like the mean. It's, okay, it's really evil. Dude. First of all, kids can be really mean. You guys remember what it was like, right? right, when, right. when they're bully- bullies are just they're just terrible, and it, it can be very very mean as kids. And what they'll do, this is really terrible, is sometimes they'll take a picture of the kid and then they'll Photoshop it and right. then share it. Yes. So like if a kid is, for example, let's say that they're calling them like fat or something, they'll take the picture and make a pig face and then send it out uh, to a bunch of people. And now you feel like, oh my gosh, all these people are a part of this this joke on me or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know? Yeah. What do you do if that happens to you guys? Have you thought about that? Like, what do you do? I mean, I think I teach my kid to to send it back and do something funny with it. Throw some shades on the, on the, the pig face and send it back out to everybody. Like you can't, I think you can't make a big deal about it. If you make a yeah. big deal about it, then you give it more power than what it really has. It's like, oh, this is stupid. You know, people do this all yeah. the time. It's it's normal. But, you know, I yeah. think that you would have to have that and like teach them how to handle it more so than like get freaked out about it or upset about it or try and like talk them down over it. Yeah. Like, oh, it's just no, like, I, it was this happened early this morning. And, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, this is the first time with this, with this particular, she's had like little things with her friends, but something like this where it bothered her to where she was crying, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my, my wife is really, really good at, at helping me stay you know, grounded because I can get spun really easily when it comes to my kids. It's like mm-hmm. my weakness, right? Mm-hmm. So she's like, she says, Sal, she goes, here's the thing. We got to remember not to make them safe, but rather make them strong. And I think that's a very, very, right, right. because uh, this is going to happen. Yeah, smart. This is going to happen again. Right, I agree. That's why I think the the conversation is more like how, what to do with it or how to deal with it versus like, you mm-hmm. know, who did that or why would they do that? And then get, like getting all, you know, freaked out about it because yeah. that energy is only going to transfer over to her and then it's only going to make it worse. Yeah, exactly. So, so I'm going to go hang out with her today and, and, and go for a drive and have a conversation about it, whatever, and be yeah. like, yeah, hey, you know, a laugh about it, try and make yeah. it not a big deal. Hey, it happens, you know. This was on a video game that she plays yeah. online or yeah, whatever? Yeah, oh. yeah. And I'll be like, hey, you know, this happens to everybody, so this is your first time. You know, it's going to happen again. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. Don't worry about it. Try yeah. to make it kind of like... Laugh it like, off. Yeah, it's almost. like a part of this now. Yeah, you got to just look for it. Exactly. Anyway, along those lines, man, I listened to... Um, a great podcast this morning. So Arthur Brooks has a podcast called The Art of Happiness. And he did a podcast on uh, politi- politics and happiness. And it was absolutely brilliant. Brilliant pol- podcast. Was it just to. him or did he interview someone? No, he has a co-host on there. And I think it's a, a, a graduate student that talks about research and stuff. And he was talking about how... So there was a study that showed that... And they controlled for all factors. So they controlled for gender, race, income, like all the factors you could control for. And they found that people who say that politics is very important to them are 50% uh, more likely to have just to be unhappy. And he says, this is something that's grown over time because we're placing so much more value on politics. And there's a new term that uh, I'm going to find the, the, the terminology that, um, that they're using these days to describe something that wasn't happening um, in the past. It's called- Homophily? No. Oh. Yeah, yeah, homophily. Homophily. That's okay, it. I yeah, just pol- saw the, the notes. <laughs> homophily. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Hey, I don't yeah. know how to pronounce it. Political homophily. So this is where, um, like, and they're finding this on dating sites. When people are dating, they are looking for other people who have similar, similar political views. And he says that in the past, this wasn't 
the case. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I thought, really? Yeah. I didn't realize that this wasn't the case in the past. And he says, in, in the podcast, he says, and this is very smart, the reason why it didn't happen in the past is because in the past, we didn't attach, we, att- we attached political views to your ideas of how things should be done, but we didn't attach it to morality. Mm. So in other words, you think because someone has the same political views as you that they are moral, they're more moral. And he goes, that's just not true. He goes, I have differing views with lots of people, but I consider them to be very moral. Uh, we just have different ideas of how we should get there. Just because you think you know, corporate tax rate should be 40% and I think it should be 20%, that doesn't make you immoral or me immoral. just means we have different ideas. So he said uh, one of the th- best things to do um, right now is to literally completely disconnect. He's like, so once you vote, disconnect. Don't, don't look at Don't watch political stuff. Don't listen to it. And he goes, it's addicting. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, listen to it like he's talking to me <laughs> yeah. the whole time. So. I, you got me right now. Uh, I've watched more and read more political shit in the last six to seven months than I have in my entire life. Same. Actually. At more, more, the closest time I had to this was, so I had a best friend who his wife was the hairstylist of um, Cindy McCain, John McCain. Oh, wife. right, right. And so she was on the campaign trail with him when he was running. And so my be- and my best friend was living with me at that time. And so the TV was on 24 seven, but I didn't sit down and I like, I just paid no attention to it. He was watching constantly. He was talk radio was on in the, in the truck everywhere we went constantly in my ear, mm-hmm. you know, telling me shit. And I just kind of like deaf eared him. I'm like, whatever, I don't care. You know, sports for nerds. That's what I've said forever about. You, were, you, you know, that was, there was more brilliance in what you said back then than, than you realize, I think. I mean, have you guys noticed your quality of life decline? Because oh, yeah. you're way more into it. Oh yeah, no, it's, you get a, you get it hasn't a, provided any substance. <laughs> no, yeah. no you you get all emotionally charged about it too, and then and then uh, and then it creates all kinds of conflict with friends because it, the likelihood that you yep. all your friends have the same political view is very very rare. That's you know? what he said. That's yep. exactly what he said. He says that he thinks the reason why people who are more attached to politics are less happy has more to do with the fact that it's uh, damaging their relationships yeah. with the people around no, them. Thank God that yeah. I, you know, the ones that I disagree with happen to also be friends that go all the way back to childhood. So we're like family, so I'm not getting rid of them. You know? so, but I could totally see how, you know, if you just met somebody like in the last four or five years and they you don't have, have like a super strong. Right, you don't have like a really, really strong foundation with them. And then you, then this, this whole thing is going on right now with uh, the election. I could really see how a lot of people why they you see all this shit going on on Facebook, which is unfriend me if you like so and so. You know, well it's like, everything's just so twisted. Like, it, 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 like COVID, for instance, it's so political. Like, well, that shouldn't be political. That should just be like a, a disease that we're all trying to like. Oh, you that's know, my biggest pet peeve of the. I'm like, the, why are you wrapping that into like your political candidate? It has my, nothing to do with that. The, yeah, my my biggest pet peeve with the election right now is that. COVID is the is the number one debate topic. I mean, everything is centered around that. It's like the truth is, no matter what is said from either candidate, we can't prove they're right or wrong no matter what. So yeah. why have the discussion? Why turn it in just so we can all be validated on like our belief? Like, yeah, he's right. That's how I would have done it too. Like, yeah. you don't know. Maybe that way is totally wrong too. Like, so nobody knows. And maybe the way we did it was perfect. Or maybe the way we did it was the worst way we could do it. Like, you can't... We can't debate that, so it's such a terrible thing to bring up as like one of the major focal points of the election is COVID. Well, it's like, one, that's so stupid. One thing he said on the podcast is how um, we can be addicted to our opinions and ideas, mm-hmm. and that's what happens with politics. And as I'm listening, like I'm, I'm like, man, this is me. Like I, I get so drawn in, and I need to find out, and I need to know more, and I need to find out, and my quality of life is declining. And it's like, just turn it off. You yeah. know, and and you know what? Things that are addicting is hard to do that. Yeah. It's really oh, hard yeah. to do. That. I find that I turn it off, but well, I want to know. I mean, I get it. Like, with the, that's yeah. why I use the, you know, uh, you know, coin the whole, your you know, sports for nerds, because I know what it's like to be like that with sports. Like, you get wrapped up in a team. There's and, lots of drama in that. Oh, too. there's a ton. And and the more you know about your team, the better you can defend it to somebody else that your team is better. Mm-hmm. And it, and it turns into that. And you can and if somebody comes at you and they they end up researching and finding a better fact or deeper yeah. <laughs> deeper information about your your own team or Here's their team. Here's why LeBron's the goat. Oh, and yeah. so then it, it sends you down the rabbit hole of like, oh, I got to defend that. You know, what I'm saying I got to be able to prove that my team is better for these reasons. You know, and so you get further into the research and you pull stats from something else and then. You know, it just turns into this yeah. this this rabbit hole of 
all you're doing is researching to prove to already uh, confirm your bias mm-hmm. already, you know, which is hilarious. And you know what's funny about sports is because there's so many teams. There are certain rivalries, right? There's like the the Red Sox and the Yankees, right? Aren't they the yeah. rivals? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when they meet, you sometimes get fights and whatever, right? right? Raiders and Niners, when those games happen, you start to see stuff happen. But because there's so many teams and because it's not necessarily like you don't think just because someone's a Cowboys fan yeah. that they're immoral. You think that they like right. the wrong team. But with politics, we have two parties. So it's like you're either on this side or you're on that side. And then we make it seem like, oh, the other side is evil. Not just that they like a different team. No. So that's what makes it so much more more dangerous. You know? Yeah, it's gotten so intense. It really does have that like good versus evil. And like both sides are like like promoting that as, as <laughs> <laughs> the devil or, you know, the angels. Like what side are you? Well, that's on? that's the other thing that I can't stand that I, I you know, obviously again, being involved in this for the last six, seven months more than I ever have is most of what I hear is, is you know, uh, attacks to the character of each candidate. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm so over that. Like, I, that's, that, that's and for you to not know that, that that's a fucking strategy, you're an idiot. Mm-hmm. Like, that, that is the strategy from the opposing side, is to make them look like a bad person. And so then people will be like, I can't believe you're voting for X. He's so this. And it's like... Yeah. What? Mm. That's, that shouldn't even be an argument. Thankfully, there's other branches of government. That shouldn't even you know? be an like, argument of your executive. basis. That would be like, in, like, and that's why I think it's silly, because like in sports talk, if you were to argue like something like that, like arguing that your team is better because they're 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 better people like no give me the stats <laughs> you know, tell That's me the, so true yeah, yeah give me the stat like what your team is better because you, you your guys are nicer and they do more community service get the fuck out of here with that conversation it's like, like comparing yeah. two quarterbacks and you're like you know this guy's got this many touchdowns yeah, yeah, yeah. And tom like, brady, yeah but he's a bad guy yeah tom brady really he helps out the elderly community you know what i'm saying so they're <laughs> but what give me stats bro like that doesn't that's not a on his wife but that's what it sounds like when i listen to most people argue politics that's why they have no business arguing you don't even know the sport very well, and you're sitting yeah. here defending a candidate with things like character yeah. flaws. How, like, now, how get are, out of here. How do you and your friend reconcile? Because I know you and your friend, you and your best friend, one of your best friends is like yeah. totally different. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys just avoid the conversation? No, we ha- we have a thread that's unfortunately it's become uh, you know a lot of that, right? So, and there's three of us that are really really tight. Going back to elementary school, and uh, two of us lean one way, one leans the other way, and. That my buddy, who is he's really intelligent. He's a principal. Um, he has his master's degree. He's very. He's he has uh, um, uh, his degrees in economics. So he's a very smart guy. So I I actually enjoy it. Like, and I told him that the other day. He actually got really upset in our thread because sometimes it could probably feel like he's getting picked on because there's two of us and one of him. And my other buddy is like the. You know, he just he he throws out all the the he's easily suckered into like the memes and the character bullshit, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so he's like throwing jabs. And then my buddy, my other buddy, who opposes that, right? He always comes back intelligently and kind of squashes what he's saying. And then I have to come in and kind of save my friend who I agree with, right? It's <laughs> like no, no, that's not how you approach this. Let me, <laughs> and so that's kind of what goes on in this thread, right? And. So my 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 friend who has very opposing views to me it was just like uh, let's let's stop with the politics in this thread it's la- it gets lame like let's, let's talk about our kids and all of this stuff yeah. like that and uh, I said I agree but I said hey just so you know I said dude I <clears throat> I really enjoy this uh, discussion with you because I respect you as an individual I know you I love you you're like a brother to that's me that's it right there man and I and I respect how intelligent you are so I actually like to hear you tell me I'm wrong mm-hmm. and and tell me how you disagree because it does it helps me either one I'm always open to changing my mind I really believe that I go into every conversation and debate like that and so maybe there's things that he can change my mind or it's only going to solidify my argument more because I'll have to intelligently defend it when I'm talking to him. What I don't want to do is I don't ever want to get into a debate with somebody who's just an idiot, who's just like, again, arguing, you know, characteristics and uh, characteristic flaws about a candidate. Mm-hmm. To me, that's, yeah. again, it's like Tom Brady likes old people, like, so he's a better quarterback. <laughs> it's just like, hot air. Yeah, that, that they're, yeah. They're it's spewing. like, no, that doesn't, give me statistics mm. to support what you're trying to say, and then let's have a, a friendly debate and conversation around it, and and we're okay. But it does, I mean, it, it, it sometimes it goes to where it gets a little heated back and forth, but because we have such a, a, I mean, we don't even consider ourselves friends. I mean, we consider ourselves family. When you go back 25, one of them's 25 years, the other one's 30 something years. So when you go back that far with each other, you do, you, I look at them as brothers. I think of them as family more than I think of them as like friends of mine. So it hasn't divided us, but it definitely has created 
more arguing and tension than yeah. it, it ever has. For sure. Oh, it's been very polarizing in my family, especially and my brother. I told you, I, we got into a really intense conversation, but after that, we just really decided like, okay, like I've said my piece, you said your piece, we can agree to disagree, and then we're, we're just cool again. And, and the good part about my brother and I is we've always had like disagreements, but uh, you know, we're family, so that's obviously an easy thing. It's like we're family, we're going to get along regardless, uh, but it, what's sad is that it's so divisive between him and my parents, mm-hmm. and and it's just become this like intense wedge. And so I'm, I'm always I used to be a little bit more leaning in in like the direction of what my my brother used to think, and and we just got sort of separated somewhere along the lines there uh, with all this the latest stuff going on in the world uh, and where we're at in life and whatnot. But uh, I, I definitely like I'm always interested in what he has to say in his perspective and so that way too i can understand uh where he's coming from and then i can counter it he can counter it we go back and forth it's it's like a cordial conversation but Mm. you can't have that with a lot of people right now which is sad yeah and the truth is too and the reason why we so we were all together right the the, this last previous weekend um and we actually avoided um, or at least me and my buddy, who I think know the most about the politics, we try to avoid. My other buddy like stirs it, throws the fucking memes out, and talks about shit, and we kind of ignore. He drops it. The, the the grenade. Yeah, he drops the grenade. That walks <laughs> away. Yeah, 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 that's totally what he is. Oh, let's let this like because he wants to hear us probably have the discussion, but we avoid it. Like because I do, a, regardless that we're okay, we're good friends. It still puts like a cloud over my day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to argue with a, a close friend or family yeah. member over any disc- oh, mm-hmm. any topic. And so, you know, it could really it could really darken a day. And so I I try and avoid it as much as I possibly can. I'm like I'm I'm over yeah. it and I can't wait for this election to be over because at that point this, this is another thing too like to your point Justin you know, this whole COVID thing should be like, uh, we're all together in on this. Yeah. Right? We're all trying to figure this out together. And I think once the election's over and whoever wins, you're stuck with that person for the next four years, it'll it'll end that whole discussion of like, who did it right? Who sh- should have been this yeah. way, should have been that way? And then like critiquing everything that's done. Instead, we'll all band together and like, well, let's there's just this so thing. many forces like at the top that are fighting each other uh, over that information. And so that's where we're getting it from is the very top is, is so divided and divisive with it. That, you know, like hopefully after this election, you know, they'll, they'll actually come together again. It, it, honestly, to me, it feels like because it's election season, like this has been leveraged so much oh, uh, from dude. each candidate. I'm fucking I'm so irritated at that. anything that will get the emotions going. They're going to they're going to spend a lot of money using. That's yeah. just 100 percent. There's billions, of, billions of dollars right now being spent. To make us, yeah, what's, and what's, then we all suffer the consequences of that. They're, what's they're, what's they're, the famous quote? Like, don't ever let a good crisis go to waste. Of course, yep, that's right? politics. And 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 you know, they're spending a lot of money to make us scared <clears throat> or angry. Those are the two most uh, effective emotions: scared or angry. Scared or angry. Mm-hmm. And so, if you pay enough attention, you're gonna like you, you're not badass. And I feel like I'm a very self aware person, and I am realizing that I am not as you know in control of myself. Is I like to think, so I need to turn it off because otherwise it riles me up too. Yeah. And I'm somebody who I think is, you know, tends to be more self-aware. So I can't imagine average person who just tunes in, gets pissed off, and then, you know, runs around. Yeah, how many that. days do we have left? I'm like counting the days. Yeah. I can't wait till it's over. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, I know. I can't wait to laugh about the way that how everything changes afterwards yeah, too. Yeah. Regardless of who gets voted in, it's going to be like all everything's sudden. an afterthought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No more drama. I was going to ask you, Justin. You were you. I was going to ask you about your weekend. You said wait till the podcast. So I want to ask you now. You were doing something over the weekend with your friends, and you wanted to talk about it. Oh, you. Oh, yeah. So what I was talking about was this wasn't over the weekend, but um, when I was with my friends one time they decided they were going to try salvia have you heard of the the yeah. you had friends that did that yeah did you i don't uh, again my friends did uh, you no oh okay. no not me no no <laughs> I, I was the only sober person in the room. I, I don't get salvia by the way it doesn't look fun it, it doesn't look fun at all yeah. and it's it's over the counter you can buy it right it, it honestly they turned into gremlins have what? you guys ever seen like so videos I, okay so i have watched it let me get this clear here okay you're Almost forty year old yeah. friends decided they were going to try. This self- is a lot. This is like years ago. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, I was oh. just telling. I was telling Sal about oh. uh, being the only sober person in a room with salvia, <laughs> and like oh, okay. what I experienced. So I was on the couch, and this was like years ago. But, That's a lot of pressure, dude, because it's kind of scary, right? Oh yeah, like so they there was at least three three other people in the room with me, and I was like sitting on the couch and we we're playing video games, and uh, so they decided to try it. The first guy like 
took it and then like just kind of like slouched into his, into his chair and then was gone. It was completely gone. And I'm like putting put my hand in front of his face, nothing, you know, and then he started like freaking out and then started to kind of like make all these weird, like groaning noises. And he was like, Bleh. and then another one of my friends got on the ground, started crawling towards the TV and was like, Bleh. they look like zombies, dude. It was really scary. Yeah. Wow. And so I don't, and that's it lasts for like five minutes. That's what I'm saying. I don't get the allure. Of, well, that's I've why seen Maybe videos it's, it's cause it's a short it's a short run that's why yeah. it's it's weird it's and everyone have the, you tried it no fuck no bro i was <laughs> i was a grown ass adult when it came around like you know and truth be told i mean maybe when if i was like a teenage kid when i did a lot of other stupid shit and it came around and that was like a popular thing but by the time that became viral and everybody was talking about it i was already into my mid to late 20s so i was already mature enough to know like this looks stupid it's supposed to be one of the most powerful hallucinogenic substances ever and yeah. if you go on youtube you know what it reminds me of is you ever seen someone who's done dmt so uh, we have yeah, yeah when you yeah, when someone that. does dmt <laughs> yeah we did see that yeah, we saw it's that very firsthand. very similar that like the way they were it's a short it's a short weird trip that you see them go on and then they're they're kind of out of it and then they come back they come back too and then it's like but i mean yeah they went to like the other side of the universe and back it was like it was crazy like i i had no there was no appeal at all for me were to, you afraid to like am i gonna have to call like yeah ambulance? Uh, yeah I, I was like are they gonna have, like start seizing out or something like it like what's gonna happen because they were just like groaning making like weird guttural noise like, like oh my God. I was, it was, it was, i'm like are they possessed like what's happening here it was yeah. crazy now stupidest thing i did when i was a kid th there was a little trend of this for a while was you would uh basically make yourself pass out did you guys remember that oh yeah that was the thing when we Dude, were kids what you, a stupid that's where you like cross your cross your arms over so your throat dumb. and then they, someone pushes on you yeah you, like, you're supposed to like squeeze it basically you're getting choked out you yeah. squeeze your carotid artery you pass out and then you wake up you're like oh what happened yeah. yeah what a dumb thing that kids do i do remember doing that so, so dangerous remember, yeah <laughs> i mean that's what it is though it's a kid i mean there's something about us at, at that age that you're drawn to these weird crazy Fear seeking things. I mean, when I think about how I used to drive my car, we're like, oh, yeah. I mean, I've, it's like you, I think every, that's why every parent probably freaks out when their kid is at that age to do it because instantly they remember how they dude, drove when I they know. were 16. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, it has nothing to do with their own kid. It has everything to do with their own, themselves and like, oh, shit, I remember the stupid shit I was doing. Dude, I tell you what, dude, you just, you just be happy right now that your boy is as old as he is because then when they start to become teenagers, you start to lose your grip over yeah. them. And then you know, you remember, you remember when you were, I remember yeah. when I was 15, 16 and the ideas I had, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, is this what I'm going to have to like deal with? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah. That's the thing too. And like, like bringing up that story, like I didn't have my kids back then. Like I was like a completely different person and I still was like, this is a bad idea. You know, and <laughs> yeah. those guys are doing like, what's happening? Dude, I, uh, I remember one time my cousins and I, we, when we first got our driver's license, we were doing, we were pulling the handbrake and doing turns. In, Drifting in neighborhoods, yeah, you know what I mean. It could have been really bad. Yeah, you know I used to go saying? off road all the time in this little crappy like Honda Civic. Yeah, I remember not that long ago with a couple adult friends driving over mediums in a, <laughs> in a suburban. That's different. Do you, do you guys remember that? That's totally different. <laughs> totally different. Jumping curbs. That was a rent a car. <laughs> <laughs> So what the hell are we doing? It's a rented car. We had insurance. <laughs> like, like, uh, spinning donuts. Totally, re totally responsible. That was oh. all because I dared you. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> what it was. Hey, Adam, we I were it. all in the same car, so yeah. that's Adam, what happens. I, I dared to drive over the medium. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh my God, that was anyway, fun though. Hey, I looked up um, our sponsor, Caldera. Did you guys know that they did uh, some studies on some of the ingredients in their products? Oh, really? Yeah. So their skincare product. I'm actually, sold. I've been sold for a minute. I got that's why I got my buddy for his birthday for his 40th birthday. I got him a bunch of Caldera. No, <laughs> like, here's the, the, the use serum. It's, it's totally not my buddy thing to do this. And I'm like, just trust me. Like, wait I, a minute, you bought your friend's skin, skin I serum? I did. I did. He's 40. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're getting older. We, Hopefully. Hey, it's, so I hope hopefully he doesn't take it. I don't personal. know what you're going to talk yeah, how, about. How is it with wrinkles? So is that okay, okay. So I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't know what Sal, where Sal's going with. That's this, what it said. Know. It said it reduced yes. uh, wrinkles in the wow. study. Wow, mm -hmm. shit. I'm yeah, and we're getting old, and we're up. We were up. In, we were up in Tahoe, face. where you're, you're dry skin and stuff like that. Like you can feel it. Like right away, I told him. I said, "Listen, I said, hang here. I know. I know this is not our thing to do. Like face serum. I said, just, <laughs> just." Go I mean, to the mirror. It used to be. I told him, I said, yeah. go in the mirror, go look at Different. your face right now, look at your wrinkles, look at your dry skin, look wow. at all this and that. And then I, and then I, I said, 
said, give him. I gave him a couple drops. And I had him rub him his face, and then look at you could see the difference right away. Yeah, like instantly. I mean, so, so right away you were no like, more crow's feet. He's yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's like, look at my skin. Yeah. Uh, ooh, yeah. No, some shiny. of the some of the ingredients in there are and natural anti-inflammatory, of course, moisturizing. So you put all that on your skin, and you're going to have better. But it's got studies. It's got studies to support it. So I think they're a great product. And your friend likes it. Uh, well, we'll see. I just this was literally this weekend, so it was yeah. his fortieth, and I got him some for. I mean, I got him other things too, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I thought that I had to tell him. I said, "Listen, this is a very nice bottle of like face yeah. serum, so don't just like use it once and then <laughs> throw it to the side because I'll take it." Back you rub from it on him. his face for him? No, yeah. I did not rub it on his face for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but like you, you find yourself paying more attention to these types yeah. of things that are like going to keep your youth and all that. It's like it's interesting. It's like, oh, okay, I guess this is where you start recognizing. Well, it. as a as a as a man too, it was very taboo just a decade or two ago. Like you just don't. It wouldn't be a thing where a guy would like use face serum no. or put like. Yeah. Well, you were getting your toenails done, so you're you're on a yeah, different. That's why I'm advanced. okay with it. That's yeah. why you know what I'm saying make fun of me. I don't give a shit. You know, it's like I, I look I, good. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. That's <laughs> I don't even give a shit. It's like <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's I'm where radiant. I'm okay using it. You know, that's why Justin still struggles with it over there because yeah, yeah. <laughs> he probably needs it the I most. Stay ashy. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's why when you have your dog here, it, it, your dog's licking his legs. Yeah, it's getting every coll- time collagen. Yeah. <laughs> Eating all my dead skin. Oh, mm. gross. Delicious. First question is from Darby Jane. What would you recommend for someone his, who is going from tracking everything to eating intuitively? You know, this is actually a, a pretty tough transition. So there's several transitions that you make when you're trying to get a hold of your nutrition, right? You go from Number one, being pretty unaware of what's in food, um, calories, proteins, uh, fats, carbohydrates, how it affects you. So the first step really is to start tracking, right? You're tracking, you figure out macro goals, you figure out calorie goals, and you start to eat according to those goals to accomplish body composition um, you know, goals or just to feel a particular way. So that's a pretty tough transition <laughs> right there, right? Going from just eating whatever to tracking and aiming for certain targets. Now, the next tough transition is to go off of tracking because you don't want to track for the rest of your life. That's a very, that can definitely develop into a poor relationship with food. You're stressed about what you got to eat and how you can hit your targets. It's just and neurotic. It can become very neurotic. We see this a lot in the, in the fitness and health space. So long term, ultimately, the place you want to be is you want to be able to eat healthy, but you also want to be relaxed about it. You know, you don't want it to be a stress where you're constantly aiming for targets and hyper aware of every single thing that you you put in your mouth. You want it to be more of a relaxed state. So that's what intuitive eating is. So to go from tracking to intuitive is another hard transition. I would argue it's a harder transition and it takes a little longer. So here's a couple strategies. One Start to pay attention to um, body signals that have nothing to do with body fat percentage, weight, uh, or muscle. So digestion, skin, um, energy levels. Uh, Start to pay attention to mood shifts. I notice when I'm stressed, I tend to aim for these kinds of foods. When I eat these kinds of foods, I feel better or I feel worse or I feel tired. Start to pay attention to those kinds of things. Start to make connections. And then the next step is to slowly come off of tracking. And and that looks like, you know, here's an easy example. You track seven days a week, hit targets. Now you're going to do it six days a week and you make one day intuitive. Um, And then when that gets comfortable, because what will end up happening is at first it'll look like an off day, right? uh, This is intuitive and it turns into like you, you eat more or you go crazy or whatever. Get to the point where that day feels comfortable then add another day, then add another day, and eventually you're seven days a week eating intuitive. It usually doesn't look linear. It usually looks like you go one, two, three days, and then find that you got to track again, mm. and then you go back, and then back and forth. But over time, it'll it'll turn into where you're not tracking. Are you saying all that? You, time. So so I I have them pay attention to all those like you know your stool, your hair, your yeah. sleep, your energy before you stop tracking. Correct. Yeah. So I want I mean I want you to kind of start to make that connect because if if all you've been doing is is measuring, weighing, and tracking calories, and then your weight probably, or looking at your yourself in the mirror. If that's all you've been doing for a really long time, it's really hard to make that just that leap to now I'm also an intuitive eating with if you haven't yet made the connection to when you're eating this way, when you're when you're hitting your targets, how do you feel all in the other categories? Yeah, you have to because otherwise it's your what ends up happening is you go from not tracking, this is what I've seen with people. 
they'll go from not tracking to still kind of tracking. So they'll go, oh, this is intuitive, but they're still eating the same way they did before, mm. or they're mentally keeping track of their macros. Because at that point, all they're paying attention to is body fat percentage, my body weight, uh, calories, proteins, fats, and carbs. So you have to start to make all those other connections because yeah. that's what it's about. Well, right? isn't the the difficulty is that you're putting all of the responsibility on what's written out in terms of like I I I know that my schedule is this, and so now like they're mindlessly sort of just taking that and then going and finding the food and applying it into the formula. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it too be beneficial to try and mimic exactly what they've been doing for a while, but not you know looking at their sheet and weighing and measuring. Well, I also think that it's, so I think the people that, so obviously anybody who's been tracking and hitting their targets really well, they can give you a generic response of, oh, I, I, of course I feel better. Well, of course you do, because you're probably eating in yeah. a, either a maintenance or a calorie deficit. You're getting enough adequate protein, but it, it's got to be even further than that. Like you have to like start to pick apart like days that you have Oh, like this day I had, you know, a bunch more fiber and this is what happened. Correct. Or this day I yeah. had, you know, less protein and I noticed my digestion was better. It's not, oh, I, I when I hit my targets, macronutrients, I feel great. I sleep good. I, I my everything feels good. So then I'm trying to hit that again. You're still not really learning how to look at what's in the day and how each of those, those decisions are affecting all the things we're talking about. You have to start to unpack that first, in my opinion. Totally. It can't be as generic as when I'm hitting all my, my targets, I feel great. You know, like this just general umbrella of like, I feel good. Totally. Because it, intuitive eating involves sometimes eating foods that are not on the menu, eating foods that might be physiologically unhealthy, like cake or cookies or pizza. But the intuitive aspect is I'm with my friends, I'm enjoying myself, we're connecting right now. It doesn't feel like a cheat day because it's all yeah. one diet. Um, so you have to connect uh, all those signals. You can't just go into it with you know proteins, fats, carbs, calories, right. general feeling good. You have to kind of understand. And it's, it is a slow process. Look, it's, it's okay. Here's a good comparison. It's like you're learning how to dance. And when you first learn how to dance, you're counting your steps, one and two, and then step back and three. You have to keep track. You have to keep count and keep track and keep count. But you can't always dance that way, right? You'll never really be a good dancer if you're always counting your steps. That's the equivalent of counting your macros and hitting mm -hmm. your macros. At some point, you just dance to the music you and it becomes- freestyle. And you enjoy it. And then you can move with your partner and then the music can change a little bit and then you can move with the music. And that's what intuitive eating- feels like. And now you also got to be patient because if you're like most people, you've never uh, really ate in a way that uh, paid attention to other than things other than what tastes good and what do I crave? That's how most people make their decisions. So it's not like you've been eating that way for 20 years and all of a sudden I'm going to track and eat intuitively. It's going to take me three months. This is a process that takes a little bit of time. It takes practice and you'll probably have to revisit tracking on and off uh, throughout this process over and over again. Well, yeah, because every time yeah. you're, you're you're tweaking it every time, right? Yeah. So like part of the transition looks like, like I was alluding to with the protein, like, oh, uh, and let's say for my, so my body, like roughly 200 grams of protein is ideal for me, like right around mm -hmm. there, right? So um, I notice because I've gone back to tracking, right? I've, I've pushed as low as 130 grams or lower, okay, in protein. And then I've had days where I've pushed beyond 250 grams. And I notice a dramatic difference. When I'm below 130 consistently, I'm just not building muscle. In mm -hmm. fact, I feel like I'm almost losing some muscle if I consistently hit under 130, like day after day after day. When I push beyond 250 consistently day after day after day, I notice it might, it's a little bit harder for my body to digest. And so there's this kind of sweet spot of where I want to land. So I've had to go back and track to kind of know what that feels like. What is exactly. a day, what is a day, a high day of like lots of protein look like for me? What's a low day? And then the same thing goes for fiber. Uh, what what happens when I'm like under 20 grams of fiber for the day? I can tell that my stool is off. What I can tell when I'm between 30 and 80, my stool is perfect. When I go beyond 80, I notice that my stool is loose and it's like weird, right? So like, and you have to go back to tracking each one of those things to kind of get a feel of it. And then you're going, what does that look like on a plate and in three or four meals through the day? So there's a the, intuitive eating is a long process and. I know we've talked about it. It's the it's the pinnacle. It's the ultimate goal. It's just like 
programming and training. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't even think mm-hmm. it's a goal. I think uh, because you don't get there. It's like saying my goal is to. It's like when people say, "Yeah, that's a good point." Because I still go back and track all the time. That's what I mean. It's like saying, "Oh, um, you know, after I get in shape, you know, you'd have clients say this. Well, after I build muscle and get lean, then I then what happens if I stop working out? Mm-hmm. Well, you just go back just to what you keep working out. Yeah, where you were before. <laughs> so really, if if I could define intuitive eating, it's this. It's eating in a way that is healthy, generally healthy in many, many different ways, both emotionally, physically, psychologically, that is also relaxed. It's not stressing you out because when you get stuck in the counting of calories and macros, Hmm. it starts to become a stress. It starts to become unhealthy. You could have perfect eating. And it still be unhealthy eating because you're obsessed with it. Well, that's what I would notice a lot of times is is it's the by all means necessary sort of approach where they you know this keeps my weight at this amount and and this is where I need to stay yeah. and it's like a, this hysteria over that versus really paying attention to what foods are benefiting you the most, what's helping your digestion, you know what may be inflammatory that you're just masking over because like by all means necessary I need to stay here. Uh, so just kind of like paying more attention to all those signs. Next question is from Nicholas Costa, 3517. The leg ex- extension machine is often demonized, but why does it exist if it's not good? It's uh, been demonized? Yeah, well, okay, so number one, I'm going to just, for people with bad knees yeah, maybe. The, yes. the, the number one selling piece of selling uh, uh, exercise equipment in the world, so the, the top selling workout equipment ever was a thigh master, okay? This was a... a, a Thing you put between a your legs, spring a spring a, that you yeah, squeeze together, pads. and lots. So that so that's number one. So just because something exists doesn't necessarily mean it's got tons of value. Now the leg extension's got way more value than a thigh master. To be fair, um, it's just there's a lot of exercises that are better. And the back half of my career as a personal trainer, I rarely used rarely used the leg extension. I used it in the beginning yeah. because it was a quad isolate. It was the only quad isolating exercise I knew, and I thought, oh, this is something you have to do mm-hmm. or finish your workout with. Towards the back half, I never use a leg extension machine with anybody because it just doesn't have as much value as lots of other exercise. But that doesn't mean it has no value, right? Yeah. It's not, and I and I found like rarely did I have a client that like had a hard time uh, connecting to their quads, and, and that being you know something that I, I was more focused on posterior chain uh, type of 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 machines or something that could help uh, connect a little bit better to you know glutes, hamstrings, like uh, quads were were pretty much uh, involved with with a lot of. And a lot of times I was trying to get uh, the quads not to be so dominant. So, um, yeah, I I mean, I would use it in terms of like just adding it in as an accessory tool to if I needed some isolation work for the quads. But really, there was so many more like exercises, lunges and things I could add that had way more value. Well, you, we have to remember that the introduction of machines was for rehabilitation first. And the leg extension has tremendous value. For rehabilitation. I mean, anybody who's tore their ACL, any sort of knee surgery, sure. that is a staple exercise that every PT is going to do with you. You normally start with just your leg of your weight or your, the weight of your leg on the edge of a bench, and then they end up putting like ankle weights on your uh, on your ankle, and then you do leg extension, and then eventually you progress to a machine that has a little bit of resistance. It's uh, one of the best ways for you to... And then if you... Uh, you know, so you don't have to add a bunch of weight. We now can use things like blood occlusion on a leg extension machine, and you can mm-hmm. get you know some great. Uh, you know, you can get some great benefits from not allowing your your quad to atrophy as much because of your knee, and then start to build the muscle back before risking a lot with like a squat or something that's or a lunge, which for somebody who just tore a ligament in their knee is dangerous. You know, somebody who just three months out of ACL MCL type of surgery. And, you know, they were to go squat or, you know, lunge, that could be really dangerous. Mm-hmm. But somebody who's sitting in a fixed position in a leg extension machine with their, you know, quad tied off for blood occlusion, I mean, gets tremendous benefits for building muscle and low risk on their knees. So the machine has tremendous value. And that and that really is the, the was the main purpose for it. Now, it was so good for that, that there's also benefits for hypertrophy and building muscle. But when you look at it from the lens of like a trainer, like we all look at it, 
the the way that you're targeting the quads, I can do that with lots of other sissy squats. I think are ten times better, mm-hmm. right? Because you you have to have good hip mobility, you have to have good hip extension, and be able to activate your glutes in a movement like that. You have to have good ankle mobility and control, good stability, and then you also target the quads incredibly in an exercise like a sissy squat. So as as a trainer, we always look at things like. You know, if this client is healthy, they didn't just t- they didn't just tear their knee. I can I can have them do a movement that gets all the same benefits as a leg extension, but and a lot more. So I'm going to do that as a trainer. But it doesn't mean that those things don't have some value. For example, if I'm really trying to target the quads, I might use the leg extension to pre-exhaust before I go into like a squat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a great use of that tool. So when you look at, when you start to look at the landscape of a gym and you're looking at all the machines, first of all, one, remember that was the main purpose of why they originally were created was for that purpose. Putting you in a fixed position to keep the rest of the body very stable so you can isolate a part of the body. Really, the most benefits to that is if you the rest of some of your body was injured somewhere and you need to be, keep it stable and you don't want to risk hurting it. And so that was the main introduction of it. So you first have to look at it like that. And then as a trainer, when I look at every machine, I know that I can emulate and get the same benefits with free weight. And with that, I that it's which is more functional to the average person. So we'll always, I'm always going to lean towards other exercises unless that tool makes sense to use. And it makes sense when there's an injury. It makes sense if I'm using it for pre-exhaust or if I have something very specific I'm trying to do or I want to isolate. Otherwise, most clients, I'm not trying to do that. You know, the only other exception is a bodybuilder, is somebody who, you know, I'm trying to isolate a part of their body because they're underdeveloped. They were judged on stage and the the judge goes, you know, hey, you got great glutes and hamstrings, but your quads are weak, which by the way, is rarely ever the case. But if that's the case, okay, let's do exercises where I can really hone in on just the quads. Okay, then it has some value. But for the average person who's trying to just be healthy, build muscle, burn body fat, it's it's a, an exercise or a machine that I'm not going to use that much because I can do other things that do, get the same thing accomplished plus way more benefits with it. Next question is from Forlavesi Claudio. When trying to increase my squat, should I focus more on intensity or volume? Well, okay, if, you're, if your goal is to get stronger, first off, intensity, volume, and frequency are all important. So intensity yeah. is how hard you, you train. Volume is the amount of sets and reps you do, so the total amount of volume. And then frequency is how often throughout the week that you actually do an exercise. They're all connected, and they sh- all should move based off yeah. of which one you're moving. They, they move are. each other. But if you had to go either or, and you're looking for strength gains, uh, volume and frequency are probably the more important ones. Absolutely. Um, you're going to get more. And you can see this with Olympic lifters, even power lifters, who lift some of the heaviest weight in squats. Mm-hmm. They squat frequently. They don't go once or twice a week at max intensity. They're squatting a lot of times uh, per week, especially Olympic lifters are doing it often, often, often. Um, and they're getting really, really good at the movement. They're getting their CNS to fire well. Um, and it just gets them really strong. I remember years ago, there was this, uh, on, you know, in the bodybuilding or muscle building forums, there was this thing that was making uh, its rounds. It was causing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of discussion. It was this squat every day program. I don't know if you guys remember this, but mm-hmm. it became a thing where, it was this challenge for the next, I don't remember what it was, 30 or 60 days, you squat every single day. Yeah. And what they did was- It's, they, it's, it's going on right, it just happened. Squat-tober. Is, oh, it's that's, still- that's, oh, going, yeah. that's why this is a question. This is I going, see. Oh, I see. Okay. that's popular right now. Yeah, and so the way they, they did it was they would tell people to modify the intensity. So you squatted every day, but you didn't squat max out every single day. And people were coming back and saying things like, I added 30 pounds to my squat. I added 40 pounds to my squat. I've, I've never had a squat go up as high as it did as when I did that. I experienced this. If I want an exercise, single exercise to go through the roof, I just do it often. I modify the intensity. I'm not going to go well, hard all the time. you just get better at the exercise. That's it. It's just like practice. And every time we try to kind of bring this back to – like. Uh, if you're practicing for a sport and you're trying to get better at a skill, you do it very often. 
And if you can do it often without a lot of intensity, it helps the body to really recognize that movement and get more effective at the recruitment process to that. So now you're stronger in it and you're moving better in it and the technique gets better with it as well. So there's a lot of factors to that with frequency that's a benefit. The intensity is something that you do want to challenge yourself with. So, but it's, I would say that, you know, that's one of those cards you don't want to introduce like as, as much as the frequency. It's, it's like nitrous for your car. Yeah. So vol volume and your frequency is like learning how, how to steer and how often you drive. So how often you steer and how often you drive is the volume and the intensity is throwing nitrous on it until you've practiced and you've driven lots of corners and you've been doing it day after day after day after day. Do I then want to apply the nitrous into the into the equation? It just it doesn't make sense. And it's uh, it's riskier. If you're still learning how to steer the car, you've only driven it a handful of times and you're also throwing nitrous on it, your likelihood of you spinning out and crashing is much higher. So get really, really good at driving and practicing, doing all that before you throw that in there because it's probably the most abused thing that I see in our space. And a lot of that is because we live in this Instagram bubble where – you know, even Olympic lifters, like you guys alluded to that, but you know, the one problem with even power lifters, Olympic lifters, they don't ever uh, video their practice. Mm -mm. You don't see, you don't see some of our good friends who are some of the, the, the best in power lifting and Olympic lifting. They're not showing when they're moving 135 for 10 reps for, you know, five of their workouts. They're showing PR stuff. They're showing their the stuff when they're pushing because that's what's cool. That's what right. gets likes. That's what gets shared. But a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't realize that those guys aren't lifting like that yeah. very often at all. They're doing it for Instagram, and then that's it. The rest of the time yeah. that you don't see, they're training the other way. They are training how to steer and drive and be frequent about it all the time yeah. before they throw the nitrous and on. And I think also there's a little bit of confusion because people think building the most muscle is going to make the squat the best. Some truth in that, but not a lot of not total truth, right? Just getting better – at a squat will make your squat go up. I mean, I remember lifting with competitive lifters. They would tweak my form. I mean, within the same workout, they would tweak my form, how I needed to squeeze, where I needed to place my feet, where I needed to drive or whatever. And I would lift five to 10 pounds more in the same workout. I didn't mm -hmm. build muscle in that same workout. It was just my technique was different. So practicing the squat does that. It also teaches your central nervous system to fire more effectively. And then because you're lifting with better technique, and then because your central nervous system is firing better, the you do build more muscle. So that's it's that's what you should focus on. It's first like a muscle. golf swing also. It's like you uh, intensity is the power that you swing. You want to get the mechanics down and the reps in of getting really good at it before you throw any sort of intensity into it. Yeah, watch me golf. It's like, wah! Well, yeah, and, and it doesn't it's, go anywhere. <laughs> and, and I'm saying that because I, I make the same mistake in that sport. It's like, and it's the same rules that apply to weight training. I should mm. know better. It's like, and I know every time I get up there, oh, because you you want to. It feels good mm. to throw some intensity in there and muscle it, right? The same thing that people approach workouts. It feels good to get that that sweat, that but burn it'll to be go sore. farther if you're smooth. And, That's right. Yeah, and your That's technique right. is sound. And so is squatting's the same way. Get the reps. In, increase the volume, continue to increase the frequency, practice, 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 hold off on the intensity, save that for like when you really hone in the movement. And then every once in a while, throw a little bit of intensity in there. Don't over abuse it. Next question is from Sarah Stone. What are some good ways to deal with a type A personality and addictive behavior? I sometimes struggle to find balance in life and easily get caught in the all or nothing mentality whether it be diet, nutrition, etc. Oh yeah, this is, this is a like tough. All of our clients. This yeah, is, well, this hits home for me. This is yeah. me too. Me too. Yeah, I, I, I I used to make a joke that that I'm like a light. Like there's I have two speeds. Like it's uh, I'm totally interested and obsessed, or I don't care at all. Yeah. And um, it's a tough one to 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 work with and juggle. I think one strategy is to become obsessed with balance. <laughs> so it's like you you it's like you're 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 focusing this laser focus that you have on the thing that will help you become uh, more balanced. So you're like, okay, I'm going to focus on being balanced. I'm going to focus on doing things that help balance my, me out. So if I work out, for example, too hard all the time, and that's my favorite thing to do, I'm going to start to obsess a little bit about hmm. yoga, meditation, uh, relaxation maybe. Just kind of start the ball rolling a little bit um, because this can burn you out. This type A personality can burn you out, can cause a lot of problems. <laughs> 
and it's going to take uh, some work because it sounds like you've already developed a, a, maybe a, your past winning strategy was to go all or nothing. Well, I, here's the thing is, um, and this one's really close to home for me, it, it serves itself for many things. It doesn't for addiction and exercise. Okay, so the all or nothing type A personality served me a lot in like work. You know, I have the ability, and I know it has for you too, Sal and Justin. Like the ability to focus on one thing, put your head down, and grind at it. Mm -hmm. You've probably had a lot of success, but when you look at things that your body can become addicted to and then also exercise, that doesn't work very well there. And you have to understand it took me a long time to figure this out. So, with I'll, I'll address the addiction thing first. So, I have the same personality. Um, I then right away, I became obsessed with always having control of of myself and never allowing something else to have control of me. So whether it be caffeine, marijuana, any drug that you could think of that we allow to ourselves to take, if I find myself needing feeling like I need it or wanting it every single day for weeks on weeks, I now like, okay, this thing has control of me. I don't have control of it. And so then I become competitive with myself mm -hmm. to be the one in control. And so, and you get better and better at that. Sometimes you're going to, you're going to go overboard. You're going to allow yourself to do something, drinking caffeine or whatever the thing may be and get addicted to it. And so you'll have to backpedal off of it and it'll be this kind of ebb and flow thing for a while. So that's the addictive, the addictive behavior thing. And then the, the weightlifting thing, I used to be like this, where I was either on or off. If I was on, I was, I was measuring my food, I was dial eating, I was training five to seven days a week and like felt great. And then when I was off, I had this attitude of like, well, why should I train if my diet was whack today? Like it, it's I'm, not worth it. It's not worth it, yeah. right? And that's not true. Uh, it's totally different for me now. Like if I, I, I'm far better off at least getting two or three days in training, even if I haven't really dialed my diet in. I mean, when you're talking about overall health and then also the benefits of training, training has so many other benefits other than just your weight gain and weight loss. Exercise is so good for the brain. It's so good for your energy level. It's so good for your sleep. It's so good for my relationships with people, like my productivity at work. Like, so it's not just about what I look like and when I'm dialed in food wise. And, and that's how I used to measure it before. It was all about, you know, what I look like. And I knew that if I wasn't eating correctly and I was training, I really wasn't going to see progress in the way I looked very much. And so then I was like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm off. But when you actually start to value exercise for all the other benefits of it, you start to look at this like all or nothing attitude, totally different. It's like, oh, okay, maybe I didn't have a great week of eating, but I trained three or four times. Therefore, all these other, maybe I didn't make progress in my fat loss or make progress in looking better, but I did have better energy. I did have better sleep. I did have better sex. I had all these other things that weightlifting bleeds into. And so you have to kind of reframe the way you look at exercise. Yeah, I think you just, if this is your mentality, you have to put that kind of intensity in barriers, in checks and balances. You have to really plan it out. And that's something you have to assess this constantly. So you have to assess each day, like uh, what you've done for recovery, what you've done. Uh, can I get more competitive with trying to challenge myself to get better sleep? And what does that look like? Um, and, and can I accomplish all this work in a, in a smaller window? And, and that's something that I've really tried to to challenge myself uh, is to be able to like be more efficient and, and figure this out so that way I can open up more space. So really, the the competitiveness for me and that drive was now you know focused more on like how much open space can I create uh, so I can you know put pour back into myself. Yeah. Now studies uh, show that there is a strategy that you can take that might help with this, and that is to schedule. Uh, breaks or vacations. Um, so because type A people tend to, things have to be scheduled and measured and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Book yourself a weekend or a week where you know you're going to go on vacation and you're saying to yourself, okay, because I'm on vacation, I know it's going to be okay to not exercise, to be looser with my diet or to not focus on work. I'm just going to relax or whatever. And they find in studies that this helps build uh, that into your life. So you start off with these scheduled breaks and then eventually you start to make them more a part of your life. Um, you know, vacations for me were something I discovered relatively recently. They did that for me. I would take a vacation and I'd find that I was able to unwind and disconnect a little bit. And then when I came back, I felt much better and I started to value them differently. So maybe try something like that out. Try maybe a workout break. You know, if you're obsessed with your workout, 
um, schedule a workout break and say, okay, every five weeks or whatever, every four weeks, I'm going to take four days off and not work out at all. And maybe you need to sell it to yourself and say, you know, it's going to help you get in better shape or right. whatever, but do it. Just take that, take the break. Um, and it help, it might help, uh, you reassess the situation and, and have a different perspective. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video, video as well as audio. So come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer at Mind Pump Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Hey, guys. I'm sorry I was late this morning. Oh, yeah. What were you doing? Um, I was trying to trigger labor. <laughs> Oh, with the wife. Yeah, exactly. We're waiting. AKA sex. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's kind yeah. of you. It's like I'm I'm conflicted about it, and I feel used. Oh, yeah. But it's sex, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, you're but, pretty uh, much a tool. We're waiting, dude. 